I'd like to welcome everybody to UNT's Constitution Day. The Constitution is actually on September the 17th, um, but we couldn't have it then, so we're having it today. I'd like to thank the Political Science Department, uh, Catherine Bork, especially the library, the Honors College, the Jack Miller Center for helping fund, fund the event, etc. Um, and today we have um, Dr. Stephen Ferdy. Is it is the Constitution doomed? No. No. <laughs> oh. I thought it was just the Constitution. Well, it, can it survive, right? Can it survive? Anyway, can so just, it survive? just a, brief, a brief introduction before he starts, because he won't stop once he starts. So I, I first met Dr. Ferdy. I came, I got into graduate school at UNT. I came up here. I went to his office. I think it was 139. He was wearing probably the most ridiculous tie I've ever seen in my life. It was thin and red and had piano keys on it. And I sat down to meet my new mentor and the first thing he said was do not go to graduate school do not come here you'll never get a job if you do come here don't study political philosophy because you'll never get a job but i guess the job before they had, had 186 applicants for the theory job so basically the best theorist in the country at the time richard rudman got the job so i looked at him and i said well i got two choices i can not go to graduate school, sell myself to the man, and take a job I don't want. Or I can stay here for three or four years, not get an academic job, sell myself to the man, and take a job I don't want. So I choose the latter. I'd rather be here for three years and not get a job than to not get a job now. <laughs> and you'll see when you ask Dr. Freddy questions, it like this. Well, welcome to UNT. <laughs> now, I studied Shakespeare. Dr. Freddy didn't know anything about Shakespeare. At least he claimed not to know. Um, and there were not there were no other theory students here, I don't think, at the time. So I basically got a private class. So we, we, I asked him if he teach me a class on Plato, one of Plato's dialogues. I wanted to read the Phaedrus uh, on Eros, and he wanted to read the Symposium, which is a different dialogue. So we compromised by reading the Phaedrus at Cool Beans on Price Street every Wednesday for three hours. <laughs> um, and this is kind of the, the dirty secret of UNT, at least for me, is I basically got with Dr. Ferdy, Dr. Ruderman, Dr. Yaffe, I basically got a private education for my PhD, which is very, very expensive normally, but it wasn't for me. And um, it was the, one of the greatest gifts, gifts I've ever gotten. So uh, thank you for uh, taking me when, I, when you told me not to come. And uh, thanks for being my teacher, Dr. Ferdy. Thanks, Ray. I don't think I was quite that affirmative about not going to graduate school, so I don't want to let anyone have the impression here that you should not go to graduate school, even in political philosophy. Um, just, you know, have your eyes open when you do that. And look at Ray. He's, he's uh, gainfully employed <laughs> at UNT. Fairly. Um, Anyway, it, I, I uh, taught here for 30 years, uh, Rafe and many other students, and I enjoyed the, it a great deal. I retired six years ago. I live in New Mexico now, but um, it's actually great to come back. Uh, you know, a lot has changed around here, but um, you know, this is a great atmosphere and the great colleagues, ex-colleagues that I had. So, can the Constitution survive? Can you hear it? Can you all hear this? Okay, um, a pretty sad topic to have for a Constitution Day talk, right? Uh, a day that's supposed to be celebrating, celebrating the Constitution. Well, I hope that I can produce a proper celebration of the Constitution somewhere along the line today, but I'm afraid we're gonna have to wade through a little bit of gloom on the way there. <clears throat> There's a story about the original Constitution Day, 236 years and one day ago <laughs> today. <clears throat> um, as the delegates were filing out of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin among them, so a woman accosted him, it is said, and asked him, Mr. Franklin, what kind of a government have you given us? And he is said to have replied, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Um, the point was 
that they did their best in writing a constitution, but it's not going to survive by itself. It requires proper behavior, some kind of input from us, the citizens. Uh, that the document itself would, would not be the, com the, do the be all and end all. So I guess what I'm trying to think about first today is what exactly is it that Franklin had in mind or what is it that we need to do to keep this constitution functioning the, the way it has been more or less for 236 years. <clears throat> Aristotle, the ancient Greek political thinker, uh, once said that in order to have a successful political community, any successful political community, you need to have like-mindedness. The people have to be on the same page. They have to agree on fundamental principles. They have to agree on what the political regime should be. And then, of course, they have to agree by, to abide by the decisions that that political regime produces for them as they go. And Aristotle also says that on top of this uh, like-mindedness, homo noia, uh, a nation needs to be sort of friendly. Citizens have to be friendly towards one another. Philia in the Greek. Well, today uh, Americans don't really seem to be so much on the same page in fact, Americans sometimes don't even seem to like each other very much anymore. Um, so um, we've lost potentially, I mean, that's somewhat something we have to think about. Have we lost that bond that is necessary to keep any society functioning? Uh, we can't even agree on our past anymore. Uh, we can't even agree on the Alamo anymore. Uh, so that's, uh, we're kind of in a hole. So anyway, drawing from Aristotle then, I, and I think from Benjamin Franklin, there seem to be two requirements uh, for a successful democracy or a successful political society. One is that there be some kind of underlying consensus on fundamental moral principles, and everyone subscribes to those. Without that, uh, you know, it's really, there's no basis for cohesion. Um, and of course, those principles should be embodied in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and all those documents that we revere as the founding documents. That's the first thing, uh, a fundamental moral consensus, let's say, moral political consensus. The second is uh, the tradition of civil discourse. That is, reasoning, not shouting. Uh, if you lose that, then obviously at least a democratic system is very, very hard to sustain. Um, people have to be willing to put down the knives, reason with each other on the basis of those common, agreed upon principles, uh, and come to a peaceful, rational resolution, or at least an acceptable compromise to all people concerned. And then, of course, the, uh, the people have to be able to um, sacrifice a little bit of their private convenience or their private good to the public good if it's necessary. Even if a particular law inconveniences you, but you're, you're aware that it's for the common good, you do that willingly. So that kind of moral uh, willingness to sacrifice, let's say, at least in a minimal way. <clears throat> so, go back to the original Constitution Day. Um, most or all of you probably remember James Madison's argument in Federalist 10 uh, that the Constitution was designed um, as a kind of balancing setup of institutions that would be sort of self-correcting, um, that it would require sort of minimal maintenance by people. We wouldn't need totally virtuous rulers. We wouldn't need totally virtuous citizens. Just the, the thing would operate as much as possible on its own uh, or be self-correcting, let's say, the checks and balances and all that stuff that you uh, remember learning about. Again, if you remember Federalist 10, 
Madison uh, said that there were two things that the Constitution provided that would help to solve the problem of, of civil concord versus discord, or faction as he called it in Federalist 10. Uh, first is that the system was an indirect democracy, not a direct democracy, through representatives, right? Uh, so the people don't directly decide. The people choose the people who decide, who are the representatives, right? So that was the first thing. Um, and the second was just the large size and diversity of the nation. Um, so there would be such a diversity of interests that no huge, large interest could, could come up and you know, form a civil war by fighting just between them, um, representing a majority of the population. So you might say that actually there were two uh, attitudes that these, these founders, these framers of the Constitution had. Some of them, I think like Madison and like Hamilton, were more institutionalists, or they put more faith in the institutions, just the checks and balances by themselves to be self-sustaining. Um, uh, the other group was more inclined to think that somehow uh, the culture, the attitudes, the behavior of the populace was an essential thing to the survival of the Constitution. Uh, that the Constitution um, wouldn't be balancing unless the people were compromising uh, and engaging in a civil discourse. Um, so in a way, their argument uh, was one of you know, we talk about today as moral health versus moral decay. Um, you needed to have a healthy, morally healthy population in order to keep the Constitution running. Uh, for example, a sufficiently virtuous populace could make almost any set of institutions work. Um, on the other hand, a population that has declined morally to a certain degree, no set of institutions can, can save. Uh, so Franklin was in that latter camp, I think. And so when he said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it, what he had in mind was his worries about the future of American democracy depending upon whether the American population could maintain the proper standard of you know, citizen virtue or whether there would be some kind of American moral decline. <clears throat> um, and Franklin, actually, if you know anything about him, I think was more than the other founders, <clears throat> he was concerned about actually instructing the American people. Uh, he wrote his autobiography, and of course he has all those sayings of poor Richard that you're probably familiar with. Um, those were all supposed to be a kind of moral education to us, uh, because that's what he was concerned about, is like the moral standing or the moral fiber, I guess, of the American population. Okay, so he was trying to cultivate certain kinds of virtues in American people. Um, so what kind of virtue was this that he was trying to cultivate and that he thought was essential to the success of the, the democratic experiment? Well, first of all, there was just public spiritedness willingness to pitch in and contribute to the common efforts and so on. And so Franklin went around and organized volunteer fire, uh, fire companies, um, you know, the neighborhood watch type things as a way of getting people engaged, not just politically, but even socially, and to create a sort of cooperative endeavor together. Um, of course, uh, voting is an essential part of this, <clears throat> but I suppose we'd have to say voting only if you know, you've informed yourself properly on the issues. In other words, democracy requires people to be voting thoughtfully and to weigh the alternatives and to uh, pay attention to what candidates are saying and so on. Um, so, uh, he was also, uh, he also was worried that Americans would become too disputatious, as he called it, arguing all the time. 
So actually Franklin says as a young man, he was, uh, he was addicted to this. Uh, he, he went around trying to refute people in conversation. And he claims he got this from Socrates. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, there's some truth to that, I suppose. So he went, uh, he was disputatious. He was interested in scoring points with people um, until he discovered, uh, you know, people really disliked this. <laughs> um, it's warm in here, excuse me. Uh, that instead of being popular because he was such a great debater, he was hated by, all, by his fellow citizens. Uh, and above all, he failed to persuade anybody because he was obnoxious. Uh, and so part of uh, Franklin's teaching about civic discourse is just some very simple points. You know, don't go around asserting that you have the absolute truth. I mean, for one thing, you might not. And then, as Franklin said, it's very mortifying to be found out when you're actually wrong and you've been so positive about it. Um, but secondly, this is the only way you can be persuasive. You know, you don't shout, you talk, you discuss, you reason with people. Um, and that's the way you can become more influential. So, you know, it seems rather obvious in retrospect, but the young Franklin apparently it took him a long time to figure this out. But he, he exhorts all the rest of us to behave that way, just to keep the public conversation going, right? On public issues, you need that kind of spirit of conversation, which seems to be uh, kind of lacking in today's society, certainly in Washington, D.C. Um, so do not treat your public discussions as competitive debates with winners and losers. It's a conversation. Um, and that's hard to do when you really believe in something strongly, you know. But if your purpose is to change things for the better, you're going to have to be persuasive, first of all. Um, uh, so that's how you get a win-win situation, an actual civic discourse. Um, and hey, you might actually wind up being friends with somebody that you disagreed with that way. Whereas if you come in just as positive assertions and hammering your points home, you will never become friends with them. Um, Franklin was especially uh, worried about the reputation he gained for religious opinion. So I have to say a little word about religion here because uh, towards the end of the talk, I'm gonna talk about some contemporary constitutional issues involving religion among other things. Um, Franklin uh, actually employed his Socratic conversations to religious topics in Boston when he was growing up as a young man in Boston uh, to the extent to the point that the Bostonians started pointing at him with horror as some kind of an atheist or a free thinker. Uh, you know, Br Franklin, uh, soon enough, had to leave Boston uh, for that and other reasons. And of course, that's how he wound up in Philadelphia, which is what he's famous for. Uh, but in Boston, um, Franklin discovered deism. So you probably all heard something about deism and maybe uh, I should explain a little bit about what that is um, because Franklin and a number of the other founders were deists. So deism is like um, the religion of the philosophers or something, the rational religion. The idea is that um, if can we come up with a theology just based upon reason and observation, right? In other words, you can't use scripture because that's unreal, because there are many different scriptures out there and you don't have any way of picking amongst them. Uh, and of course, scripture is always ambiguous and people argue about scripture all the time. Um, so can we come up with a purely rational religion that we could therefore all agree on and so the deism was the, uh, based on the idea that, well, yes, if you, for example, you look at the natural world, you see how orderly and harmonious it is, 
you conclude there must have been some intelligent designer behind this, right? So there, that would be an example of sort of a proof of the existence of God just from observing nature, right? Uh, then you could say um, this order is very beneficial to human beings, and so we conclude that this is a benevolent God that we have. And so you, you proceed in that way, and you come up with a religion that is a rational religion. Of course, one thing that, you, that reason will never tell you is that there was a man named Jesus who walked the earth 2,000 years ago and who was also a divine being. So that's why deism is not strictly, usually not Christianity, because reason can get you to the notion that there's a God. It can't get you to the notion that Jesus' ministry was a divine ministry, right? For, rev for that, you need revelation. Uh, so, Franklin settled upon a version of deism, when, even in Boston, but he didn't go around proselytizing deism, okay? Um, as I said, uh, one reason that he became, had to leave Boston is because he became known as kind of a disciple of deism, and he was trying to refute all the Puritan beliefs of his neighbors. He gave up on that, uh, and finally he, he came to the view that um, all religions are good politically speaking, right? To the extent that they all make us virtuous, they all uh, make us more self-sacrificing, we all make, they make us more friendly to one another. And so he became somebody who just supported every religion that he encountered who asked him. Um, to the degree that he thought that they supported public order. Now, he was kind of annoyed that you know, some preachers were more interested in making good Presbyterians than good citizens, as he put it. Um, but religion is a great thing just because it helps to bolster this, this uh, public morality. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville, um, the, the French author who was an observer of American politics and wrote what, what is still maybe one of the greatest works on commentaries on American democracy in 1840. He said that American democracy is successful precisely because the Americans are so religious um, because for the same reason. You know, they are self-sacrificing, they're public-spirited and so on. Um, but their religion is private. Uh, you see, um, Americans have uh, embraced the separation of church and state. One of the temptations of religious people often is to look at politics and see it as a, a moral cesspool and thinking, well, maybe if we just injected more religion into politics, it would straighten out politics uh, and correct our ills. But uh, as Tocqueville says, and it, it, Tocqueville says, American, American ministers of, uh, of the word, American men of the cloth, they do not want to get involved in politics because they know um, that even though your intention may be to purify politics by bringing religion into it, all that actually happens is that politics corrupts religion instead. You have ayatollahs driving around in fancy limousines and stuff like that. Um, so the Americans have discovered, according to Tocqueville, and I think Franklin definitely embraces this accommodation, um, that being a religious people is important, but not having a religious government you know, the separation of church and state. In other words, any religion that you have, it doesn't even have to be a Christian religion, it could be deism, uh, will work as long as it makes you better citizens. And that's all Franklin is concerned about as a political actor. And of course, that's all Tocqueville was interested in as a political commentator. Um, so that's kind of the situation that Franklin left us with in the Constitution. So with that background, I wanted to turn to some contemporary issues, as I said. 
um, issues in, in constitutional interpretation, like constitutional law. Uh, first, and this is one that deals with religious uh, exercise, there was a case in 2018, a Supreme Court case, where a Colorado baker uh, refused to make a wedding cake for a gay wedding. Uh, now Colorado had, has, a anti-discrimination civil rights kind of law uh, forbidding discrimination against, you know, gay uh, couples and a, a number of other categories. Um, and so the, the baker was trying, was challenging that Colorado law on the basis that religious expression allows me to discriminate in this way. Now the court, the Supreme Court in 2018, actually sided with the baker. Um, and this, you know, if you remember this story at all, uh, that was the headline you saw, that the Supreme Court allows, you know, the, the baker to refuse to make wedding cakes for gay couples. <clears throat> and that's true, uh, but in fact that case would, was decided on a kind of technicality and the court punted on really the basic issue. And the basic issue here is um, we have two principles. The first is religious expression, freedom of religion, right? And the baker said that my freedom of religion requires me not to serve, you know, people whose views I disagree with um, religiously. And obviously on the other side, we have the moral principle of anti-discrimination. You know, the right of people not to be discriminated against. So what we wanted the court to, to decide was how to resolve those, those two issues. In that particular case it did not because as I said, it uh, decided on a technicality. So inevitably there was another case, this time in 2023, this year, also in Colorado, also based upon that same discrimination, anti-discrimination law. Um, and uh, once again, the court ruled in favor of the designer. In this case, it was a web designer. Right, so um, the web designer didn't want to make a website for a gay wedding, sort of on the same grounds. Now, once again, the court ruled for the designer, and that would, of course, the headline. Um, but the basis of the ruling was kind of narrow. That is to say, the, the, the ruling is, was that um, the web designer can refuse to do this because web design is an artistic expression and you can't force artists to produce art that goes against their beliefs, right? So um, the designer won the case, but the basis of the ruling was narrow. So for example, artists are apparently free to discriminate in this way but what about Uber drivers? Can Uber drivers refuse to transport gay people or African Americans or white Anglo-Saxons or what have you? Um, so this, I mean, you recognize this issue. This is a, uh, an issue that, uh, that's uh, in American society today uh, and an issue on which uh, the sides have sort of abandoned the Franklinian approach. Now, the, the two sides um, approach uh, it an all or nothing thing. Either it has to be all expression or all religious, um, all non-discrimination or all religious expression. Um, but what I'm trying to do here is to see if there's some basis for a rational discussion between these two groups, right? Is there some way we could turn this into a more rational or, re rational or reasonable discussion in the public realm today? So first, I'm going to look for some common ground, that consensus. I mean, there's, if there's some 
principle that both sides agree to, some fundamental principle, that could be the basis for uh, conversations going forward, a rational resolution, right? So here's my, uh, what, I, what, what I would say um, might be an avenue to actually achieve that. Um, first of all, I think we can say that both sides in this debate agree on the validity of the other side's principle. In other words, everybody believes that religious expression is a right. On the other hand, we all realize that there's a right not to be discriminated against. Okay? So one side of the debate just focuses on that one value, the other side focuses only on the other value, um, but they really both agree on both principles. The problem is that sometimes, let's say religious expression in this case, and the right of non-discrimination conflict. And the reason why this is such a difficult case is because you, you have two conflicting, equally valid moral principles. That's what makes it so tough, right? Uh, so what, how can we think about this um, to maybe try to help resolve it or at least to, to find a path to, uh, by which it could somehow be resolved? Um, and I think maybe if you start this way, you might have, make, make some headway. Um, if we recognize the validity of the two principles, we recognize that the principles come in conflict, neither principle can have 100% of their way. So it seems like some kind of compromise is necessary. Now that's kind of difficult to say or to think about or to accept because compromising on moral principles is something you're not supposed to have to do, right? But the problem is when you have two moral principles that conflict, they're going to have to compromise, right? Or else it's all one or all the other, uh, which would be probably extreme and unworkable. So I think if we recognize that bo both sides recognize that we have a need to compromise here, that would, be, that would make the conversation, I think, a lot easier. I mean, I think everyone will agree that religious ex expression is a fundamental right, but it's also a right that can't be carried to, you know, radical extremes. Like religious, religious expression will not excuse you in human sacrifice, for example. So there are limits to what the religious freedom can be. And similarly, discrimination, you know, there might be cases where some kind of discrimination uh, is necessary on some grounds. Um, and so what I think that we might say that the two sides in this, uh, in this issue um, differ really maybe only in where they draw the line as to where you, where you uh, draw that, where you make that compromise, right? So I think if you see the issue in that way, um, it might be a lot easier to carry on this public discussion. If everybody started by admitting, okay, we're going to have to come up with some kind of compromise here. It's just a matter of where we draw that line between religious expression and non-discrimination. That makes it a much more manageable debate, right? Uh, less, much less acrimonious. And so, inspired by Benjamin Franklin, I would just say that maybe that, something like that could be a path forward for this country to help save the Constitution. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's take uh, another issue, one more issue. Um, this is Roe v. Wade. And I'm sure you are all aware that Roe v. Wade was reversed last year by Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health. Um, so Roe, of course, was the case in 1973 that discovered a constitutional right to abortion, at least in the first two trimesters of pregnancy. 
Um, and it arrived at this conclusion by resting, well, first the problem is of course abortion is not actually mentioned in the Constitution. It's hard to imagine Franklin or his crew would have ever done that anyway. Um, but so how do you establish like a right to abortion? This is just the, the, the issue here about Roe v. Wade. Well, um, they said there is a right to privacy. Um, the, the, the abortion is rooted in this right to privacy and relying on some precedents, they said, well, there's a right to privacy in the Constitution that will cover abortion and many other things. Uh, and, but the problem is, of course, privacy is also not mentioned in the Constitution. <laughs> um, so what they argued in 1973 was that there is a privacy right kind of lurking in the Constitution between the lines, or as they put it, um, there's a privacy right that can be seen, that can be sort of inferred from um, the first, third, fourth, fifth, ninth, and fourteenth amendments of the Constitution. <clears throat> um, now, I'm not taking sides on this abortion issue. I'm just trying to find out how we could turn this into a much more civil conversation than it has been. So let me just sort of give some of the pro and con arguments here. The argument of Roe v. Wade about um, emanations from penumbras of these different constitutional amendments is an argument that even some pro-abortion people have regarded as sort of questionable from the beginning. I mean, it's not mentioned in the Constitution. You're kind of inferring it from a number of different constitutional passages. Um, so uh, there are a number of you know, interpreters, of course, the whole um, Federalist Society, a sort of society of conservative legal commentators. Um, they've been against this logic from the beginning. <clears throat> and so uh, that makes the argument a little bit squirrely, let's say, or at least you can make that case. And then, of course, there's also the issue that if there is a, this right to privacy in the Constitution, that it is, that's such a vague thing. How do you decide what is included in this privacy right? Uh, in particular, how do, if there is a privacy right, how do you know that abortion is included in it? So, I mean, there's, there's a number of, of legitimate issues here, is all I'm saying, um, uh, for the anti-row crowd. And, of course, if you do find a right to privacy in the Constitution, even though it's not mentioned and very vague, <clears throat> the, the end result of that is that judges get to decide what your privacy right consists in. Right? If it's a constitutional right, that's, that's good. But that's the good news. The bad news is that nine judges are the only people who get to decide what's in that privacy right and what is not. And so what happened was in Dobbs last year, the court changed its mind, I guess. And they said, well, yeah, there isn't a privacy right to begin with in the Constitution. That so <clears throat> um, on the other hand, so that would, that's sort of the, the rationale for being against Roe or V. Wade or, or thinking that it was a weak case to begin with, right? The argument against it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in favor of Roe v. Wade, I suppose you could say, if, you had, if that woman in Philadelphia in 1787 had asked Benjamin Franklin, Mr. Franklin, have you given us a right to privacy? <laughs> I suppose he and all the other founders would have said, of course there's a right to privacy, right? I mean, who, I suppose all of us here believe that we have a right to privacy, like a legally enforceable right to privacy. Um, so there is a kind of moral consensus that we have such a thing. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we have to support it somehow. So I guess if we believe that there is a right to privacy 
and it's not mentioned in the Constitution, how do we support it then? Well, you can say that it's, um, it's sort of implicit in the Constitution, right? And like the First Amendment, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, the amendments against search and seizures, and you have to have a warrant and all that, that sort of points to a privacy, right? So that's a, that's a solid enough argument potentially. So I guess what I'm trying to say is simply that the two sides here, I think there's more grounds for conversation. I mean, it's not necessarily as black or, and white as you think. On the one hand, the privacy right is kind of shaky because it's not mentioned in the Constitution and so an inference from an inference. On the other hand, we all believe that there's a right to privacy, and I think we could all agree that the, the founding fathers would all have said we had a right to privacy if you asked them. Now, ironically, this is kind of, um, this was sort of predicted by James Madison in Federalist 84. Um, you know probably that in the original Constitution there wasn't even a Bill of Rights. And that was a big point of contention between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists in that point, that debate. So, for, uh, so Madison in Federalist 84 is arguing as to why we should not have a Bill of Rights at all. And here's his, his argument. Well, you, um, he says, first of all, we don't need a Bill of Rights because this Constitution sets up a very limited government, so it doesn't have the power to oppress your rights anyway. Well, obviously, the, the opponents didn't buy that, and the Federalists were, were eventually persuaded or forced to agree that, yeah, 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 okay, we'll put in a Bill of Rights if you ratify this Constitution. And true to their word, they put in a Bill of Rights. But Madison gave this argument as to why a Bill of Rights is not a good idea. Uh, if you make a Bill of Rights, that's a list of fundamental rights, yeah, um, what happens if you forget and leave one of them off the list? <laughs> uh, and so Franklin says, the, a Bill of Rights looks like an expansion of our liberties, but it might actually be a restriction if some big right was left off the list. Does that mean we suddenly don't have it because somebody didn't get on the list? Uh, and so you might say that that's sort of the case with this abortion privacy issue. I mean, it seems like privacy or something like it, I mean privacy or autonomy, I guess that's the other uh, way that it's described in constitutional law. Um, those are rights, but they weren't put on the list back in 1781. So does that mean we don't have privacy now? So in that sense, the Bill of Rights could backfire. I mean, that was Madison's argument. And maybe you could see it, this is a kind of um, fulfillment of that prediction or worry. So anyway, I just want to um, conclude, I guess, by putting this out there. Like, is, how could we possibly create more civil discourse on this issue of abortion and the privacy, right, and Roe versus Wade and Dobbs versus Jackson and women's health? Um, I think the fact that we all agree that there is a privacy right, and once again, I guess that just turns the argument, this is an argument about what exactly is in that privacy right. Now, I don't know, I mean, abortion is probably a harder case than cake catering. <clears throat> so I don't want to, you know, be too sanguine about this. But I think if, if there's going to be any kind of resolution to this, issue, any return to civil discourse among us on these kinds of issues, we have to find some common basis in the issue that everyone can agree on as a starting point and come to realize that we're sort of arguing about different nuances, about the different trade-offs, about where the privacy right begins and ends about where freedom of religious expression begins and where non-discrimination begins. Um, and in that instance, I mean, I, I'm not making any big promises, uh, but it may be that the survival of the Constitution would 
depend on something like that. You know, us being able to return to the table, return to rational discourse, based upon sort of an analysis of what what fundamental ideas and beliefs we all really do share, um, and turn down the extreme or disputatious rhetoric, as Franklin would have put it, um, and begin sort of the hard discussions about where we're going to draw these lines. And that won't get rid of disagreements, but let's say with a certain amount of good faith, uh, if we agree, if we all agree to abide by the results of the discussion, whatever it is, that's one of the fundamental requirements of a, of a decent political society, we might be able to hammer something out. Um, and maybe today we can start that discussion, and I suppose there'd be a lot of questions on, uh, on that, or you can certainly talk about these issues in your classes later this week, if you want, but let me just leave it there as a, as a kind of proposal for how we might overcome some of our worst divisions, um, possibly. Thank you for making me look like a plagiarist to all my classes, <laughs> um, an inarticulate plagiarist. So I'd like to, um, especially the undergrads, we have a, just a few more minutes to hang on. Especially the undergrads, uh, I'd like you to ask a question or two, no matter what it was. Feel free to raise your hand and go. Back here. Uh, yeah, so the question is, if returning to virtue is the solution, who says what virtue is, right? Something like that. Um, well, I guess that would be part of what we have to agree on, right? I mean, if, if I think society has to have some kind of fundamental consensus on what the virtue is, right? So I guess if we have to begin with the consensus, of, I mean, we all believe that all men are created equal and endowed with cre inalienable rights and all that stuff. Um, right, yeah, in this country, I think, I don't know. there are probably very few who don't believe that here, but I don't know. Uh, but yeah, certainly other societies, and historically speaking, there's, yeah, that has not been the consensus. Uh, well, I, I think that Franklin and the American founders did not believe that moral principles were relative. Uh, so, but that's one thing. But right now, I wasn't really talking about sort of the philosophical foundation of morality and virtue, but just the, the fact that if you don't have consensus on that, you can't have a functioning society. If people disagree on fundamental things, like we think they're the master race, and half of our population is of an inferior race, that's not a very good recipe for a stable political order, right? So, um, I mean, Franklin certainly would have thought that the, the principles that he's championing, which are sort of democratic principles, are the true principles. And I think the United States has functioned as it has for its history because all Americans do fundamentally agree, you know, the principles of de the Declaration of Independence. So, yeah, I mean that's 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 just a matter of like what makes a what makes a functioning society. Um, we, you know, the philosophical question of which society has the correct moral principles. That's a deeper one that you know Franklin and others thought about. But we, you know, I don't think we have time to talk about that today. Um, yes. Addressed. People don't always believe things because they're looking at the outside and deciding that it's it's rational. 
socialization plays a really big role in what people are believing. And so people coming from different cultures and believing different things, having a different lens on society, not because they have determined that it's good, but because that is the lens that is that, that, that's just kind of been built up in their psychology. Mm -hmm. I think, um, so I think on that note, it, I think it's going to be a lot less, it's gonna be a lot less realistic to get people to just conform to certain ideas. And I mean, a lot of the idea about rights is that it's something people should have even if a lot of people believe that you shouldn't. I mean, women have the right to vote and misogyny is still very rampant to this day. People didn't just, everyone just come together and come to a sort of, a sort of social, uh, debate and the logical conclusion that women should have the right to vote. Suffragettes were out there freaking throwing hatchets at people. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I, I don't think, I don't think just the idea that everyone should, that everyone should just kind of like come together and come to a conclusion on fundamental principles. I think, I think there's a lot of more complicated things that need to be thought about before we can really think about how that's even, mm -hmm. how that's even possible. Yeah, and th that is sort of related to the first question, which is you, at some point you do have to worry about whether you got the right principles. Not just the fact that we all agree on these principles here, but they're the wrong principles. So, yeah, and I think that <clears throat> um, that's the way that things really work. And I, in, in the United States, let's say on the issue of women's rights and the, the right of women to vote, even though we have a long ways to go, I think there's been a lot, certainly nobody would deny, would imagine denying women the right to vote now or to have careers or to go to college and get degrees. Pardon? You'd be kind of surprised because a lot of people like that. Well, yeah. Well, I think that the, if the social consensus in the United States at this point is, you know, obviously in favor of women's rights, but um, certainly imperfectly carried out. Uh, but you're right also that, you know, the, the moral principles that people hold to are, are typically the ones they were just brought up with. Uh, and so that's one reason why Benjamin Franklin, for example, was so interested in forming the American sort of moral perspective, like with all of his poor Richard sayings and so on. It was a way of kind of bringing people around to a more democratic or more egalitarian view of things. Um, so that was part of his project. I don't know if that really, I mean, that's kind of the thing you were talking about. is that when a lot of people debate, they kind of treat their ideas like it is in, like it's an identity, or kind of cloak it in, mm -hmm. in things like, well, this is just my personal opinion. And then it, and then once it just becomes an identity of two that's a personal opinion, that it'll just stay that way regardless of what anybody thinks. And so I think, is there is there a way that for people, are you saying we should just basically just kind of get rid of any kind of sort of identity that people feel or perceive for themselves and then and then kind of have that rational discussion. Uh, yeah, so the, the question is, uh, is uh, if I understand it, is that uh, one reason why this is so difficult is because people's identities are tied up in their convictions. And you know, that's that's natural, and that's partly why this is always so difficult to have real discussion about deep question, moral questions, because people are invested in their views on those things. Um, but people could be open to persuasion, or at least moving, and that's what I was trying to point to. If you, if you find something, some fundamental idea that you share, then on the basis of that, uh, for example, the you know equality has been part of the American creed from the very beginning, um, but it took a while for that equality to be extended to people of different races and genders. But still, there was that underlying principle, the force of that principle over time gradually did move the whole society in the direction of greater and greater equality. 
Um, but yeah, there was certainly resistance and people had their identities tied up into it. I guess what the civil discourse that Franklin and the High I'm talking about does require people to sort of become a little less invested maybe in, that, in their, I mean, in other words, you have to be willing to imagine compromising your beliefs. You, your identity cannot be that tied up into it or else you will never be persuaded. You're unpersuadable. Steve, the crowd's getting antsy. How about one more question? And then we'll... Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so civic discourse and compromise have always been difficult, uh, just for humans in general. But we've seen an increase in polarity consistently over the last several mm -hmm. decades, right? Decades and decades now. Um, can you speak a little bit to like the specific problems that may contribute to our difficulty with civil discourse today? And how we can potentially start reversing that trend? Do you have any idea of like... How to do it? Well... <laughs> I was trying to, I, you know, I put out some suggestions. I don't know if... It, or do you have something else in mind? No, so... Uh, <laughs> I guess we're just talking about how, how we can actually get this civil discourse going again, right? Yeah. Yeah, so increased polarization and obviously the internet or at least the trolls on the internet and disinformation and all those things that, yeah, that make it a lot more difficult. So if you're asking me like how, how likely is it that we do this, I don't, I, I would like to think that we could pull this off and return to like civilized conversation, even among opposing sides, um, but it would require uh, you know, kind of people getting off the high horse to some degree, and I, you know, I am open to suggestions about how you can do that, uh, other than what I have suggested, which is simply point out to people that we all share cer certain fundamental beliefs that are, have to at least be the beginning of the conversation, and we're just differing about what we mean by equality exactly or what we mean by religious expression exactly, and where the, the limits of those things are, that just makes it a somewhat easier conversation. It still is not going to be easy, 